I would like to begin with a show of hands, but actually I'm not going to because many of you might feel a little uncomfortable sharing medical secrets with a room full of strangers. But I'm going to hazard a guess that a decent number of you at some stage have suffered the excruciating nerve pain that comes from a herniated disc. Those of you who share this delightful memory will understand what went through my mind as I watched a scrawny Peruvian man hoist two 100-pound bags filled with rocks out of a hole in the ground and then shuffle them over to a resting place 20 feet away from him where there were another pile of rocks. As he punched over, waddled across, um, I, I almost could feel the, the spasms in my back sort of spontaneously happening. But the fact of the matter is this guy actually had a far more pleasant job than his partner who was working down below him. His colleague was 100 feet underground uh, in a crudely built mine shaft that sat at the bottom of this six feet wide hole that was built into the, a foundation of red clay. And down there he was chopping vigorously at a seam of rocks with some gold flecks in it. His only escape, a rickety bamboo ladder. He spent 12 hours down there that day uh, and he would be allowed up twice to see the daylight. So this is a work environment that uh, I can imagine is somewhat removed from the one that you and your clients are typically engaged in. Certainly the salaries paid to the executives that you place in these positions around the world are a long way from the $12 a day wage that these guys are earning. Uh, and the safety and health concerns are of course of a different dimension. But the fact is that the international forces shaping your industry, um, and Henry's account clearly demonstrates this and it seems to me from the agenda that that's the case as well, uh, the trends that are seeing management suites filled with diversified nationalities, uh, your client base spreading ever more global, and just the, multiple, the multiplicity of accents that I've heard as I've walked in here today. Um, th these are all obviously indications of this big globalizing force. Those same forces are shaping the labor markets in places like this barren, dirt poor region of northern Peru, a place that is now dotted with thousands of illegal mines. Uh, those workers were doing that grueling work there precisely because of the globalization of finance and of the crisis, in, in particular of the crisis of 2008. So I chatted to one miner and he said his name was Jorge. He had quit his job at a supermarket uh, because when he went out drinking on Sundays with his buddies who were working in the mine, he discovered that they had twice as much money in their pockets as he did. The Mineria Informal, as the illegal unregulated mining business is known, was booming. I'm sure some or a couple of workers perhaps had died in collapsed mine shafts and a few had become sick from the cyanide and mercury that is used to leach gold from the bedrock. But the financial incentives, the financial incentives in uh, Jorge's mine outweighed that, so he joined up. Now whether he knew it or not, Jorge's decision was directly influenced by a massive rally in world gold prices. It was 2011 at that time and hedge fund managers such as John Paulson and George Soros had for the past year and a half been betting big on gold ETFs. As measured by the London Daily Fix, the, the spot gold price went from $1,121 an ounce in early 2010 to $1,895 uh, just 21 months later in November. Now it's since fallen back a bit, but at $1,600 an ounce thereabouts, we're still three times as high as we were at the beginning of 2006. Now as the price went up, so did Jorge's salary, or at least the capacity to, to earn that. After all, the London Fix, which is a convention that since 1919 has depended upon the daily de deliberations of just five uniquely appointed bankers, is as relevant to Peru's illegal mining business as it is to the gold business everywhere in the world. On any given day, the London Fix could be used by a New York pawnbroker to determine how much to lend against a hocked necklace, uh, by a Canadian mining company to, to put a value on its hedging portfolio, or by Jorge's employer when he negotiates with truck drivers, drivers who would turn up on a weekly basis to take his consignment of ore. It establishes the profit equation upon which Jorge's wage is based and thus the compensation function against which he decides whether it's worth putting his life at risk. If that's not a marker of globalization's reach, I'm not sure what is. Now, the cause of the post-crisis spike in gold prices and thus of the proliferation of illegal mines like Jorge's can mostly be attributed to a profound shift in investor psyche as savers became alarmed about the dysfunctional state of global finance in the wake of the 2008 crisis. Yet, it wasn't that the world was beset by a 1970s-style breakout of inflation. 
uh, the kind of event against which gold has historically been used as a hedge. For all the unprecedented money printing that he has unleashed over the last few years, $2.5 trillion in quantitative easing and counting, Ben Bernanke was completely correct when he said during a rather testy exchange with Senator Bob Corker of Tennessee last week that no Fed chairman since World War II has kept the consumer price index better contained than he had. The problem is that the CPI and other conventional measures of inflation tell quite literally only half the story. The fact is we live in a curious moment in which both deflation and inflation coexist. This bifurcated world has proven to be highly profitable for a new breed of businessman showing up down on 47th Street, where, near where we're based, uh, which is the Diamond District. Whereas that place has historically been the domain of Orthodox Jewish jewelers who are practiced in the fine art of appraising diamonds, the post-crisis period attracted an influx of brash gold traders to that strip. They proliferated because their businesses occupied a sweet spot between global deflation and, and global inflation. On the one hand, deflationary forces unleashed by the housing bust assured them of an abundant supply of gold as, as people who'd lost their jobs and who'd fallen behind on debt repayments and could no longer obtain credit from newly, the newly stringent banking sector streamed into their offices. They were bearing gold rings and other mementos to either sell or pawn for the cash that they desperately needed. On the other hand, inflationary fears helped the diamond district dealers out in the second phase of their transactions. Uh, as they found that refiners who melted gold jewelry, taking the, the objects that came in and melting them down into ingots, were paying an ever-increasing price for those products. And that price game was driven by savers who had the opposite reaction from these, these other people and were desperately wanted to get out of cash. Looking at the near zero interest rate returns on their bank deposits and the soaring price of gasoline and other commodities, these fearful investors worried that their dollars would rapidly lose value. Gold investments were their refuge. In all, it was a great deal for the Diamond District dealers, but if you think about it, this split personality economy poses a dilemma for people like Mr. Bernanke. Which scourge is he supposed to fight? Criticism of the Fed's crisis response, which involved setting interest rates at near zero and launching an unprecedented massive monetary expansion, does not actually hold up when gauged against standard domestic benchmarks. The Fed's so-called dual mandate dictates that it must seek both price stability and full employment. And since the former is not a problem when measured by the CPI, and since interest rates cannot go any lower, the Charter essentially compels the Fed to adopt quantitative easing to achieve the employment goal. Rather, the problem lies in a disconnect between the nationally defined mandate and the international reality of the economy in which the Fed now operates. The misalignments that have created the current environment of high debt, weak demand, and depressed pricing in consumer goods cannot be solved with domestic policies alone, not without, I would argue, a significantly greater degree of international policy coordination in monetary, fiscal, and financial regulatory affairs. Only through multilateralism can we properly restore the global economy to the stability that businesses and consumers need to, to maintain the sort of growth that we had before the crisis. The problem for the Fed and other national policymakers with domestic constituents in this age is that the decisions of all economic actors, including Jorge the Peruvian miner, are profoundly affected by international shifts in demand and supply. To illustrate, let me demonstrate, let me display my shirt. Uh, it, it's 100% cotton and as far as I'm concerned has a good cut. It fits me just how I like it. Uh, but when I bought it last month, it cost, cost me, wait for it, Six dollars. Uh, I suppose that might be another bit of, you know, too much information for you all. You perhaps wanted to, to believe that one of your speakers was clothed in a classier outfit. Uh, but hey, I'm, I'm a journo, not a banker, and uh, you get what you pay for. And as you, you were paying attention at the beginning, you'd know that that's actually uh, zero. So um, uh, more importantly, my shirt purchase is illustrative of the price depressing effect that an endless cycle of productive excess is imposing on the economy for tradable goods. The world is awash with white cotton shirts like this one, as, as it is with jeans, and jackets, and shoes, and smartphones, and laptops, and electronic toys, and so on. Domestic policy tools like those that the Fed wields can do little to nothing to address this issue. So this shirt was made in Sri Lanka, 
But its price, as with so many other products, is contingent upon a de facto benchmark that was set in place by the rapid pre-crisis expansion of Chinese manufacturing capacity. This brings us back to China. Um, manufacturers call it the, man the, sorry, manufacturers call it the China, China price. To understand what that means, I visited a maker of printed circuit boards in Manchester, New Hampshire, called Electropack. Just one decade ago, the company was at the peak of its success. The Y2K overhaul had spurred a surge of demand for its products. It ran four factories in three different countries, had 476 staff, and $50 million in sales. It also boasted one of those pre-crisis badges of corporate success, a private jet. But just 10 years later, its number two executive, the founder's son, who'd spent his entire adult life at the firm, had quit the company because it could no longer afford to pay his salary. Electropack was down to 40 staff, working out of its last remaining factory, where everyone walked around in coats because the heat had been, had, was being rationed. What had happened? In a word, China. Y2K had coincided with China's entry into the WTO that Henry mentioned earlier, which meant far greater access to the US market for that country's producers. In a few short years, low-cost Chinese firms had perfected the science of building the complex, customized circuitry that Electropat's customers, US customers needed, and those same customers were now demanding that Electropack meet the same price as those Chinese newcomers. The China price literally squeezed the life out of this New Hampshire company. Similar tales are told by manufacturers across this country. Now, I don't actually regard Electropack's fate as a bad thing per se. I'm a die-hard advocate of free trade, which means you have to accept that firms in one country will be priced out of existence by those in another. I also believe in globalization. Since 1990, more than 400 million people have been lifted out of abject poverty. The world has halved infant mortality rates, greatly advanced literacy levels, and, lived and, and lifted life expectancies everywhere, all because of the opportunities that global economic integration have provided to emerging market producers. The problem, however, is that we haven't updated our political structures to deal with this new, hyper-interconnected global economy. And so we're saddled with a matrix of incompatible policy structures. This has created perverse incentives for investors who now have the capacity to move capital around the world in a split second. In the lead up to the crisis, it fostered market distortions, overinvestment in the Chinese export industry, for example, and credit bubbles in housing markets such as the United States, Spain, and Ireland. The former artificially depressed prices in some sectors and the latter inflated them, a mismatch that ultimately produced financial volatility and uncertainty. This is the defining economic problem of our age. Let's not begrudge China its success. And the statistics that Henry laid out give you a clear idea of, of what that country has achieved in such a short period of time. It has risen to the tough demands of globalization like no other country, working hard to meet just-in-time inventory requirements, embracing technology in its supply chains, building top-notch infrastructure. But we must note that much of the Chinese boom was built upon a highly interventionist, mercantilist model. In essence, by depressing its, its exchange rate, uh, set, setting ceilings for deposit interest rates, and restricting the savings options of its politically shackled working and middle, middle classes, China created artificially attractive circumstances for people to invest in what became an oversized export sector. These interventions generated trillions of dollars in excess savings. The three trillion dollars that Henry refers to as reserves, I don't necessarily see as a badge of success. It's a badge of of, of displaced savings that could be used in a much more constructive way within China itself. Um, that money inevitably flowed into the US government bond market, where they drove down benchmark interest rates and helped create the giant pool of finance with which US banks engaged in an orgy of risk taking. The sins of Wall Street in Washington that led to the 2008 collapse are well known. The mania for complex securitized mortgages, predatory lending pa practices, the distorting government guarantees that that uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, engaged with, and the general diminishing of credit standards across the board. But there's very little focus on how the giant savings glut fostered by China and other export-driven nations in Asia facilitated this. In effect, China produced both the goods and the credit machine that allowed American consumers to live the illusion of prosperity through the bubble years, and for the government to build upon what is now a seemingly insurmountable debt it's an issue that's obviously getting a lot of attention at the moment as uh, a kind of existential crisis perpetuates in Congress. 
This is not to shift blame for America's cavalier and undisciplined debt management, but it is to explain th that the problem did not arise in a vacuum. Both sides pursued domestically driven agendas under the belief that they were doing best by their people. China focused on producing jobs for almost 10 million annual entrants into the labor force, and the US was driven by the goal of widening home ownership. Unwittingly though, their policies worked together to create an untenable global imbalance between excessive savings on one side and excessive spending on the other. It had the appearance of a symbiotic relationship, but it was really a dangerous codependency. At some stage, it had to break. And break it did, in dramatic fashion. What's most worrying, however, is that after that, those cathartic events of 2008, too little was done to correct the policies that created the imbalances in the first place. And that means, I hate to say, that another potentially even worse crisis is a distinct possibility. More than a few people are drawing parallels between the Dow's move to record highs yesterday and the euphoria of 2007. The fact is that governments largely doubled down on existing strategies that we know fostered the instability in the previous bubble period. Rather than shifting its economy away from a concentration in exports and investment-led growth, China froze its currency at an artificially weak level and launched a massive bank finance stimulus plan, a package that in per GDP terms was three times the size of the 2009 American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And as a result, China's infrastructure improved prodigiously. Its high-speed rail network took in a massive $270 billion in investment in just three years' time to become the most extensive in the world almost overnight. But it almost also left China started with even more overcapacity. Some of you may have seen the 60 Minutes story on the problem of the ghost towns uh, on Sunday night. And it's ensuring, therefore, that it, it, it continued to, it ensured that it continued to offer an unusually cheap manufacturing base. And as a response, in the 2009-2010 period, US companies ramped up their outsourcing activities. The strategy kept shareholders happy as profit margins were preserved, but it did nothing to improve the US job market. Against this internationally driven deflation force, the Fed was more or less powerless. It pumped trillions of dollars into world markets, but could not restore the US economy to proper health. The newly printed greenbacks merely escaped into foreign currencies or into the dollar-denominated commodities that China needed to fuel its monster construction boom. So inflation showed up there and not in the US. The prices for iron ore, steel, lumber, and cement all rose, as did those of investment properties in Shanghai and Hong Kong. Of course, gold also rallied as a natural counterpoint to the falling dollar. To make matters worse, the Eurozone soon erupted in its own crisis, uh, one that reflected an another failure to calibrate policies with international realities. In its case, the fiscal integration of the Eurozone. This created more imbalances in global demand and supply, and fueled more anxiety toward the fragile global financial system. So things are looking a little bit more stable now, and that's a good thing. But there's a, there's a kind of consensus, I think, at least amongst a lot of financial commentators, that um, something's just not quite right. You know, we're at this awkward moment. The Fed is now buying $85 billion in bonds every month for an indefinite period. It, this, it's, it's not actually QE3, some say. They call it QE infinity. And, and this, of course, is, is underpinning the, uh, the rather spectacular gain that we're seeing in the stock market, despite the fact that Italian elections are looking like they're, they're a disaster and, and uh, you know, the economic numbers from around the world really aren't, aren't particularly rosy right now. The Bank of England is committed to zero interest rates and it could revive its own dormant QE program. The Swiss National Bank has imposed a floor on the value of the euro versus the Swiss franc. And Japan now has a government that's forcing the country's central bank to adopt an aggressively pro-inflation policy. Okay, it's a race to the bottom in monetary stimulus, a de facto competition that may quite rightly fear, that many quite li rightly fear could develop into a global currency war. So, in the West, uh, let me just jump a bit, a bit here ahead then. Uh, the West, much lip service has been given to reforming a fragile financial system, but in reality, too little has been done. And the changes introduced here have come in a piecemeal, inconsistent way. Banks that were too big to fail are now even bigger, and if they get into trouble, no one knows whether the wind-down resolution authority granted to the Fed and other central banks will work in practice. Um, faced with this sort of dysfunction, 
it, it really is time for the international community to pick up the discarded mantle of what the IMF calls reforming the international financial architecture. In particular, countries should strive for some sort of arrangement for valuing currencies against each other. It's admittedly a bold call, but I say we need a Bretton Woods II agreement. Now, uh, you'll have to bear with me on this one. The, the, the dollar, of course, is, is, is a dominant force in the, in the world market right now. It continues to be, obviously, the, the global reserve currency. And uh, it, it is actually at, at the centre of, of, of many of the world's problems. In my view, it, it, we need to find a way off of that particular machine. Um, the, essentially, what we need is a... Uh, depoliticized system for, for global currencies. Perhaps uh, some sort of IMF managed global depository or investment fund in which national central banks can place their foreign currency reserves. There's also room for a cheaper private sector solution to global exchange volatility and misalignment. I met yesterday with a Danish businessman with a rather unique proposition in that regard. Uh, uh, but no matter what the solution, any move by the US to concede the dollar's dominance would require a quid pro quo from China and other countries that they let their currencies float. Beijing would also have to open up its financial sector to foreign competition and create an open capital account like America's. Meanwhile, countries should develop a common guidelines for fiscal policies. On top of this, we need to modernize the regulation of financial institutions so that global banking behemoths can no longer exploit international loopholes and are disincentivized to take excessive risk with implicit taxpayer backstops. If we don't coordinate all these responses, the mismatch of solutions will continue. Regulation will increase, but but will become even less effective. And central banks will just keep printing ever more money as a stopgap. The end game, I hate to sound so gloomy because I had a, a more positive ending, but since I'm <laughs> being rushed, I'll have to leave on this one and we can take it from there. But the end game is a currency war. Uh, and the last time we had one of those was the 1930s. And let's just say that didn't end too well. Um, I will just mention to, to sort of lift the spirits a little bit that, it, that this really is possible to fix. And the fact that Henry was mentioning the idea of a, a world talent organization speaks to the fact that we can believe in multinational and multilateral institutions. And I would suggest that the WTO that also featured in his presentation is a remarkable example of the things that can be done on an international multilateral level. So as soon as everybody was, is most likely to say it will never work when we talk about international cooperation, I think the WTO and the success that, that has brought in the massive expansion of world trade over the last two decades does give us hope that we can find our way out of this and uh, I'll leave it at that.